Good evening. Welcome to Left, Right and Center. I'm Vishnu Shobh. On the program tonight, the Finance Minister has launched the center's ambitious national monetization pipeline. It's a four-year pipeline for those infrastructure assets that the government plans to monetize in order to generate funds. The goal is to finalize 6 lakh crores worth of infrastructure assets that includes national highways, mobile towers, railway stations, stadia, power grid pipelines, among other key assets. So we'll be joined in just the next few minutes by the Chief Economic Advisor to the Government of India, Dr. K.V. Sobramanian. Later on on the program, as the Taliban claim to counter-attack those areas which the Afghan resistance say that they took over, we're joined by a very special guest and you will not have a sharper insight into the crisis in Afghanistan. Ahmed Wali Masood, the brother of the legendary Afghan leader, Ahmed Shah Masood, joins us live from Paris. He has a direct stake in the battle to defeat the Taliban in Afghanistan. But let's go straight across now to our top guest on our top story, the Chief Economic Advisor to the Government of India, Dr. Krishnan It's a big day today with um, a big national effort now as far as building up infrastructure, the national monetization pipeline, 6 lakh crores in the pipeline to be implemented within four years. First up, that seems very difficult to achieve. Um, have you identified these projects? Have you identified partners? Do you seriously think in four years you would be able to generate these funds? Uh, thank you very much, Vishnu, and a very good evening to all the viewers. Um, along with the National Infrastructure Pipeline, um, which was developed in uh, December of uh, 2019, where the assets were identified for infra infrastructure investments, this is a very important uh, initiative um, that combines with the capital expenditure push that was done in this, this year's budget. And Niti Aayog has actually done some excellent work in identifying the assets um, that will be put up for, uh, for, for asset monetization. Uh, at the same time, also thinking about the models that would be employed for doing the, uh, the, doing the asset monetization. Uh, this has to be seen, Vishnu, in the broad context of uh, the government trying to actually enhan enhance productivity in the economy, uh, both through privatization and you asset monetization. In four years. That was my question. In four years, six lakh crores, you'll be able to achieve that or come close? Uh, so I think that the uh, targets actually are, are, because they've already been identified, the projects have been identified, much like the uh, National Infrastructure Pipeline, uh, this is not something where the homework has not been done. The homework has been done by the Niti Aayog. And for this year, for instance, the target is, a, is, is about 1.6 lakh crore. Um, now, it's possible and we like to, I, you know, we'll have to wait and watch on this year's target. But I'm actually far more confident that this, the four-year target of 6 lakh crore would be achieved uh, because uh, the ministries also have expressed actually their willingness to come on board on this, which actually oftentimes, you know, is a very important aspect. Okay. Now, a key part of this is that the government isn't giving away this property. You are putting it on, a, yeah. you, you know, you've got a model, which is a lease model, a PPP model, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but uh, is that something which could prove to be a problem? Because a company looking to take over an asset might find long-term value if they procure the asset. They would perhaps argue that the value goes down if they have to give it back to the government. So on a project-by-project -project basis, would there be some hard convincing that the government would need to do to a prospective partner? See, uh, Vishnu, if you look at uh, the models that are used typically for uh, assets, firms both own some assets and lease other assets. And, and you know, both these models are, are very commonly employed by private sector firms. Um, and uh, the asset monetization together with the privatization progr program is basically the effort to try and provide both options to the private sector. The privatization is basically where the private sector can own those assets. Um, and, and the asset monetization is one where they can lease those assets. And, and because both of these are very common, you know, uh, um, models that are employed by the private problem, 
I think in the Indian context, this is something that actually we're using for the first time, and therefore, you know, uh, your questions may be legitimate. But I think this is something that has been used the world over. Uh, you know, uh, the, the asset monetization. Uh, there are other countries like Australia, Canada, etc., who are also talking about asset monetization during this period, during the COVID period. So India is not the only country that is doing this. It's actually the, it's a tried and tested method, and so you know, I, I think we will definitely be able to accomplish the targets that we set for ourselves. You know, I find it really interesting that 1.6 lakh crores um, is what has been pegged to just the road sector alone. Now, this, I, I, I'm sure you'll accept, that has been a historic problem in India. We do not build roads historically in the pace that we want to. If we compare ourselves with China, we know how far ahead they are in that. So, four years from now, if these projects actually take place, will we, you know, expand road coverage? Will this mean that transportation people moving from parts of our country on world-class highways can just be a reality, can be a, not just a dream. I mean, we drive from Delhi to Meerut now and we see, my God, this is possible. Will it be possible in other parts of the country as well? In, in fact, uh, you yourself answered that question, Vishnu, by talking about the, you know, the Delhi Meerut highway. Um, what was not thought possible, uh, you know, six, seven years back has actually been shown to be possible by this government. Um, look at the pace at, at which road construction has happened over the last six, seven years. And I think that is actually testimony to the ability to execute these ambitious plans. Um, do, do keep in mind, actually, that for the ministry now, the asset monetization actually also provides an additional incentive to be able to actually complete these projects on time. And therefore, you know, I, I, I and also the identification of these assets has been done in a way that, you know, we're sort of plucking the low hanging fruits, because if you look at the overall assets that are there, actually, this is still a very small proportion of the overall assets that can be leased. And therefore, it's just the low hanging fruits that have been plucked. So I think that this should be something that should definitely be possible. 1.5 lakh crores from the railway sector. The railway sector, many would say, and the assets that we have is essentially the family silver. So many governments in the past have said they don't want to mess with that. Uh, the, there were proposals, for example, to get into catering, uh, involving other, uh, other players, uh, other companies. That never took place. IRCTC is one of the few organizations. That's also part of the government. In a sense, it's part of the railway network. And now you're saying that they'd be foreign, they'd be uh, not necessarily foreign, they'd be private companies in the Indian railways. What would they do? Um, Vishnu, this is, um, in my opinion, unfortunate language that has come in, family silver, which does not really fit the description of these assets. You know, firstly, the private sector will, you know, should, will and should object to the fact that they're not part of parts you know, seen part of the of the family. When you think about the economic family of the country, the private sector is as important a sibling in that family as the public sector. So this, so that's the first word which I think does not fit. And as for whether these are silver, I actually, if you look at the the way in which actually these assets, the productivity has been come, I think they're nowhere close to silver. So neither the family word nor the silver word actually fits the the actual the evidence. You know, the data. I mean, it's a different matter to actually put rhetoric like that of family silver, etc. But when you look from an economist's perspective, I think the word family silver just does not fit the description of these assets. So I think by putting it into hands that are far more productive and actually seeing the private sector as a family, which the Honorable Prime Minister has now said in the fourth floor of Parliament, I think that is where we're really making it family silver. Today, actually, then, I don't, I don't think that you know, either the family or the silver word fits it. Okay. I'm just going down that list, 11,500 crores from stadia in the country. That's interesting, right? I mean, we see, for example, the BCCI being incredibly successful financially in running cricket stadia across the country. So now the government would be willing to partnership, partner with a private player and, you know, stadiums, I believe like Jawaharlal Nehru Stadium over here in Delhi, they'd go to a private player. How, I mean, how, how would you generate 11,500 crores from that? Uh, Vishnu, what you have to remember here is these are assets that are being leased, right? And therefore, the lease contract can be worked out in such a way that it does not have to mean using that, that particular stadium for all 365 days of the year. Right. You know, the fact that remains is for these stadia, 
they typically get used for a certain number of days maybe 50 60 days of the year and you know once you plan that calendar what you can do is you can lease out that asset you know during times when actually the stadium does not get used and that is what really enables the you know the productive uh, the, the assets to be productive in the economy and and that is the flexibility that you have um and i think this is something that is very good because now given the performance that we've all been very proud of in the olympics i think you know bringing streams of revenue into other sports through uh, mechanisms like leasing the stadia is actually a very good avenue to, to empower and enable these sports as well to bring bring laurels for the country and a final question to you the power sector right 79000 crores from the power sector so again to what end uh, we already have companies for example in delhi we've got bscs rajdhani then there are other bscs and things like that that's helped to a large extent uh, but what exactly are you trying to do in privatizing aspects of the power sector uh, it, it's not privatizing i right. think the, the ppp model idea. right what exactly yeah, do, do you intend to do yeah no not privatizing so, so this is this is part of a larger scheme for bringing efficiencies in the you know in the in the in the power sector as we all know discoms actually you know because of various um, uh, practices that you know cannot be sustained um, have been bleeding and i think you know they need to be reformed if the quality of electricity and power that you know both our households and corporates get has so to cut actually down be on transmission no, and distribution losses right make it a more efficient yeah. right system yeah. right uh, less yeah. corrupt uh, more efficient we, 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 sorry go ahead no no i i i'm just trying to understand so the 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 end beneficiary would be a consumer like you and me uh, a more reliable power network a more reliable power grid yes um, as it is with not just this reform with every other reform you know that this government has done over the last year year and a half every reform is eventually about making the citizens life better about actually you know the ease of living and and it is no different with the power sector either because if you have discoms that are bleeding the eventually the it is the consumer that ends up paying you know through through unreliable power unreliable electricity so i think this is part of that larger scheme of really enabling ease of living for our citizens all right well this is uh, all very exciting let's hope it actually does generate the funds that it is meant to because india needs this for infrastructure development uh, you know capital development capital funds are required at this stage i'd like to thank you uh, dr subramanian for being with us let's see how this plan goes i'm going to quickly move on now to our next big focus this evening now the afghan situation is uh, is the big international headline the government in fact here in india has called an all party meeting to discuss the afghan crisis there are thousands of people from afghanistan who've been coming into our country historically the ties between the two countries have been very very close but the focus is also now on the afghan resistance they've been known in the past to be the northern alliance and it appears that there is a fight back which is taking place how much is this fight back from the panjshir valley going to change the situation on the ground we have in this world exclusive interview a very special guest ahmed wali masood chairperson of the masood foundation is the younger brother of the late ahmed shah masood he joins us now and it's wonderful to have you sir you're joining us from paris Firstly sir the ground situation to the best of your understanding have has resistance forces been able to successfully regain some territory from the Taliban Well yes the resistance forces at the moment they are staying in Panjshir some part of one province for some part of Kapisa and it just in valley of Andhra province on on Baghlan so there are parts of the resistance but at the same time there are other parts in central afghanistan as well so at the moment the resistance is uh, getting more uh, mr masood um who is leading the resistance is it um uh, ahmed masood uh, is it um, the former first vice president amrullah saleh i know you are part of it who is leading the resistance who is the face of the resistance well there is no doubt that of course the resistance although that belongs to all people of afghanistan but right now at this moment there is a young man ahmed masood who is the son of ahmed shah masood the national hero of afghanistan he is at the moment leading the resistance in the panjshir valley in the jassan provinces around the panjshir valley right your nephew over there uh, very bravely leading and he's just what 32 years old right yes and um, sir um, 
what sort of international support um, beyond ideological support because I'm not sure there are too many nations which support the Taliban other than Pakistan but internationally what support are you now getting? Well, at the moment, there is no support whatsoever like that because the resistance is very new. Not to forget, only a week ago, the government of uh, Dr. Ghani and Amrullah Saleh and the rest, they fell. So, therefore, that resistance is very new with the leading force of uh, young men like Ahmad Massoud. And there are people who are really kind of contributing to that. But at the same time, let me say that when I say the resistance, resistance does not mean the fighting. Resistance, it means against the fighting. So at the moment, the priority is that how exactly um, we can stand against those fighting, against the onslaught of the Taliban, not to allow them to attack those areas where we are holding. So we are proposing a sort of peace proposal, a dialogue. Let's see whether it will uh, be practiced, it will come into effect or not. If it does, of course, we are for that. But if it doesn't, then of course, the resistance have to go ahead. That's very interesting. You are suggesting a peace proposal while at the same time fighting. What is your peace proposal, sir? Well, at the moment, what we are really kind of proposing is that we are calling on the Taliban to really curb the violence, to curb the searching of the uh, house, houses of the people, to curb the sort of uh, stop the launching of the attack on the area that they have not been there, to really uh, stop this sort of selective killing of some politicians and some commandos. We have been calling on Taliban to do that one. This is a priority. But of course, the second priority for us, what sort of provincial government will be set up? That is, will be out. I mean, the outcome of any dialogue. So I'm just trying to understand um, how Panjshir, which is a relatively small area, is holding out in the face of a Taliban supported by Pakistan. Uh, I believe you know you, the, the northern parts uh, have also collapsed because mazar sharif has gone to the Taliban as well. That riverine border you have with Tajikistan, the Amudarya River. Uh, that is also no longer in your hands. I've been to the Panjshir Valley, I've been to Bazarak many times. And I'm just trying to understand, sir, how is your home homeland, the heart of the resistance, going to survive this? Yes, I there are some confusion. People really think what happened. Uh, the rest of Afghanistan fell but like that Afghanistan fell under and wrapped it like a Shabani and his government. So that was them who were fighting the Taliban. So they could not resist because of the leadership that fell. But now the resistance which are kind of hung up, this is the people, not the army, not the government. But the people who generally to save their own homeland, to defend their own homeland. So it's very quite different. Of course, the spirit amongst the people is very high. They really generally want to defend their own homeland against any injustice. So therefore, that is kind of very separate from what happened to 20 years of investment on that army and a very corrupt leadership, which really uh, ran away with billions of dollars. Uh, Mr. Masood, what, what do you expect India to do? There has been a historic equation between for example, your family and my country, uh, between the Northern Alliance and my country. Do you expect India to have a role now? Well, what we really expect at the moment, right now, at this moment, inside Afghanistan, we really expect the sort of consensus amongst different ethnicities. We really call on the Taliban as a Pashtun uh, to come with the rest of the ethnicities like Tajik, Hazar, or Uzbek to really forge an alliance and make the peace. This is the first pillar of peace in Afghanistan. But the second pillar of peace in Afghanistan is that the, the, the neighboring country and regional power, they really have to kind of come into some sort of consensus on Afghanistan because they should kind of, I mean, put away their rivalry in Afghanistan. They all should come to really help to strengthen a national government inside Afghanistan. That is the priority. If we can get the two together, the consensus inside Afghanistan and the consensus in the region and extra region, then we can have some peace in Afghanistan. The role we all have to play at the moment is for peace. But if it comes to it that then we don't have no alternative, then of course that will be another stage. Would you rely on India's help if there is no alternative but to fight? Well, in the past that has been during the resistance, of course. Very when much we were so. fighting against terrorism, I, when we were fighting against terrorism, the one country and uh, some countries amongst them, India, was one to extend their help uh, to the resistance. But as soon as the 2001 
uh, then the new chapter came, then India completely forgot everybody and just went away and it completely disappeared from the scene. So now there is something that, uh, of course, if it happened, then of course it needs some help as well. But we hope, let's hope, let's hope that before that happens, let's hope that we can have peace, we can have a dialogue, we can have some sort of uh, understanding with the Taliban to forge a government of unity or some sort of peace government. But it all really depends on the um, kind of flexibility of the Taliban, whether they have changed or not. If you talk about have got a program, we have got an agenda, we know exactly what's required for Afghanistan, what sort of system, what sort of government, how exactly we can reach inclusive government. We all have this agenda. Uh, sir, just one point. You know, you say that India disappeared after 2001, but India has invested more than $3 billion in Afghanistan since 2001. Well, uh, as well as the United States also invested billions of dollars in Afghanistan. But really what happened? The whole thing vanished. Why did the whole thing vanish? Because some of the country did not take care of okay, who exactly they are supporting in Afghanistan. Mm. Let's say one of two speakers was Dr. Rashtar Ghani. At right. the end of the day, who him called himself, he came as a theft, as a burglar, as somebody corrupt, as somebody who stole millions of dollars, billions of dollars. So therefore, if you do investment in such thing, it will be wasted, as it's wasted like that. Ashraf the Ghani, same way, was a burglar uh, in your country. The rest country. of the government. You feel he, I, and those were your words. Well, there was. Of, right, right. Very strong. I mean, those were very clear burglars in our country. And that happened, really. I mean, what I'm trying to say is this. All the friendly country to Afghanistan, they really have to genuinely seek peace in Afghanistan. What exactly, how exactly we can have peace in Afghanistan? That's very much not to really kind of support a burglar, a corrupt, a somebody who is running away, who really kind of vanished the whole thing, the whole country, and just disappear altogether. Um, sir, is it your fear that once America leaves the airport along with NATO, then all of these statements by the Taliban that, you know, they'll allow the media and that Afghanistan will not be used to target any other country uh, and that people will be protected, minorities will be protected, all of that will disappear? Well, at the moment, they have not yet really shown if they do that one. They have promised something like that, but we still have not seen a practice. We'll have to wait until maybe they say, well, the dust is high. Let's give us some time to get together because until now, their leadership is not known who is the, exactly is their leader. But once it does come down, listen, time, we can know what is the definition of inclusive government as far as they are concerned all of that has to be known then we can uh, decide we can judge so a final uh, question to you and a personal question your family and you personally are deeply invested to democracy in afghanistan and uh, you know i mean civil society in in afghanistan the rights of women in afghanistan the right of the vote in afghanistan how personally devastated are you that 20 years has become zero now. Well, it's it's, it's it's really kind of, it hurts. It really hurts, you know. It hurts because, it, you know, we really have to start from scratch again. We really have to start from where? What happened? Why the international community? I mean, the whole hope was at the end of the day, the international community will not leave Afghanistan alone. At least they will let them. What happened? We are at the moment just out there. We don't know what to do, where to go. And the whole thing, it's really hurting. It's really hurting because it's, it's something like that people invested. Where is the people's life? Not only that they lost the property, not only that they, they lost their life, their identity, their belongings, their everything they lost there. Nothing happened. The hope was that the international community at the end of the day, they will act responsibly. But they did not act responsibly on the, on, on, on the Afghan people. And that is really hurting. Um, Ahmed Wali Masood, it's an honor speaking to you, sir, and hopefully the resistance will be alive to bring back the change and the, de the democracy that we want in Afghanistan. Thank you very much for speaking to us. Well, on this Thank program, you. there have Thank been several you. questions from our viewers. This is a question on coup which has come in from Indu Bhagat. The resistance in Afghanistan, will Amrullah Saleh be able to ward off the Taliban? Hopefully we've got several answers to that question. And we did a poll as well on coup. Is the Afghan resistance strong enough to stand up to the Taliban? 50% said yes. 50% said no. We're completely out of time on this program. My colleague Sanket Upadhyay will be up next for the moment. This short break.